All right, my guest today on The Forward is, is actually an old friend of mine, Ken Rideout. I met, I met Ken, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, we did a training camp that he came to, and, and, and I met a guy who, who, who grew up uh, outside of Boston who was, man, the, the first second I met him, he was just constantly talking trash. Well, wait till you listen to the episode. This will all make perfect sense. But he was a great athlete. He hammered on the bike. We went for some runs. I thought this guy, you know, and by the way, he just wanted to bury me on every ride or every run. And I'm like, all right, dude, enough of this. Then you fast forward, I don't know, five or six years, and I start reading all these articles in legitimate outlets, Outside Magazine, The New York Times, uh, I've seen him on other people's podcasts, you know, uh, the world's fastest marathoner above the age of 50. And they had all these pictures and, and the, it doesn't look like a marathoner. And, um, and, and as I was tracking his story, because we didn't talk about this when we first met, he had such, I knew he had a, um, a, a kind of a wild and uh, interesting would be the wrong word, but a, a complicated uh, upbringing. Um, not, not the smoothest of upbringings. But um, as I learned more about his story, there was so much that I didn't know when we first met, you know, talking about addiction, talking about even harder times than I thought. Um, the part that I did know about him was uh, his journey with his family now, um, three beautiful young boys and a beautiful girl they adopted from Ethiopia. So I just encourage you to listen. By the way, you know, disclaimer here, more F-bombs in this podcast than any episode of The Forward ever. Um, but I always, you see this rough and tough guy that still likes to talk trash and, but also loves to share, uh, his journey with everybody. Uh, I always think back to his family and just how generous he has been. And, 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 and also certainly generous, like I said, with, uh, being willing to share his story. So uh, I thoroughly, I didn't honestly being honest, I didn't totally know what to expect in this conversation, but I left, um, just totally enamored with it. I thought it went great. And so a uh, big thanks to Ken for, for coming on and sharing his story. And um, I think you'll get a kick out of it. You, and I think, you, you know, in his next marathon or one of these crazy running challenges he does, I, I think you find yourself, uh, if you're in the hood, you'll find yourself out on the, on the side of the road cheering this guy on. So enjoy the show and uh, thanks, Ken. Ken Rideout, I, I just, I have to start with a question, you know, because when I last saw you and talked and was hanging out, you know, you were just sort of this, which I have a lot of these, by the way, so no, t don't take any offense. You were just this dipshit buddy of mine. <laughs> and I turn around, I mean, not literally, but, you know, in the blink of an eye, I'm opening up the New York Times, I'm opening up Outside Magazine, and you were always talking trash. Let's go for a run. I will fuck it. I'll beat you down. <laughs> And I was like, settle down, Ken. <laughs> and then I started reading these articles, the world's fastest 50-year-old marathon. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't go for that run. That would have been a beatdown. But like, this is like a thing. Mm. I guess I just hung around long enough until people started falling off and I was the last man no, standing. No, that's, but th this is a whole new level. <laughs> nah, I to your point, I was always doing a little bit of everything, but being mediocre at a bunch of shit, jack of all trades, master of none. And uh, I don't know how much of like my addiction journey we've ever spoken about, no, but, but that, I was that's like, another part uh, uh, that, that really that I did not know. And, uh, you know, at least, you know, it was popping up in these articles and I was like, hang on a second. Like, I know Ken pretty well. And and I also well, I didn't know that, but I didn't know when that sort of was and when it ended. Cause I think we first met. We met right uh, when I was like eight, coming, eight or nine years ago. Yeah. I'm, we met right when I was coming out of it, but still like struggling to get some longevity. So I'd be sober for a month, fucked up for a month and just like kind of, um, seesawing back and forth and, um, trying to use the endurance stuff as a mm -hmm. way to stay sober. And then, um, which is very common. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people do. Yeah. And and I think that um, at some point I was just like, man, my life is ticking by and I'm not making a difference for anyone, including myself. I was just like decent at everything. Work, husband, dad. I was just 
fucking mediocre. And at some point mm-hmm. I was just remember a conscious decision of like, I'm not going to fucking do this mediocre shit anymore. If I'm going to run, I'm just going to pour myself into it. Mm-hmm. And, um, I recognize early on that this winning at running is a simple equation. Probably you feel the same way about cycling. I was like, I'm just going to fucking train harder than everyone. And I'm going <laughs> to leave like the, the race was just like, like a beauty contest. It was like the fucking work is done. I'm just here to show off now. Right. Like I've already suffered more than anything that could happen in this race. And I, I e- even if that sounds like hyperbole to people, like <clears throat> I convinced myself that that was the fucking truth. And on race day, I'd also get into this mode of like, I'll fucking die to win. I, I, and I've left the races like a few times in an ambulance where huh. I'm like, I'm going to fucking drop dead. But I was like, after the finish line. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once during the race, during Ironman, Texas, I left in an ambulance from the bike and I was all fucked up. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I took so it on as a what, source of you know, We all did that camp. It was kind of a man camp training camp. We did down in, um, outside in Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, in Scottsdale actually. And, and, um, so, so, and there was like, I don't know, six or eight of us there. Uh, Rick Cattello was there, a bunch of good dudes. But, um, so this was, this was, this was a sober period. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's hard to tell which one I, I when I was so. sober, when I wasn't. Right. Cause right. like with that kind of addiction, like I would be high, like 24 seven, like I'd go to bed, wake up immediately, take pills and stay like oxys and yeah like percocet right. um you know oxycontin fentanyl if i could get it whatever oh, I could. Dear same exact shit same exact thing it's just it's all fun, you know yeah and it, you know i've only ever experienced that stuff from surgeries right yeah. which they give you for you know if you have a big surgery recovery and i was like ah, this you know it didn't really even help me you got any yeah. advil i'll just rock the advil <laughs> yeah. like i'm cool with that um but if that, you know, that, if that was, if there was any bleed over there, like you, I, I mean, I have a pretty good radar or meter going, yeah. this guy's, this guy's fucked up. <laughs> but I mean, I, I said, I did say that about you just so you know, but I, it wasn't in the sense that like this, this guy, what is this guy on? Yeah. Um, but wow. Yeah. That, that we have never talked about that. Mm-hmm. And that's that to me outside. Look. The surprises are the surprising uh, performances, you know, just because it's so fast. I mean, to, just to put this in context for the folks listening, right? Would your PR is 229? 228. 228. So to run 228, a lot of people, they know that's a fast time, but I think it helps if you break it down per mile. 539. The people, 539. So, so people then in their minds think, well, if I go down to the high school track, <laughs> And I could just go <laughs> for anybody listening or watching, just go on down to your high school track. Right. And, and it gets even crazier. You know, Kipchoge's 430 and 434 or whatever yeah, it is. Crazy. It's crazy. I mean, that's, it'd be hard to run a four, it'd be hard to run one lap of the track at his pace. Right. Today's episode with Ken Rideout is brought to you by Eight Sleep. The pod cover by Eight Sleep will keep you cool all night, all the way down to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Whatever that is in Celsius, you can figure it out. But here's the deal, you wake up fully refreshed. This is particularly important for elite athletes because sleeping cool improves deep sleep and overall sleep quality, which enhances the body's recovery. And everybody knows better recovery leads to better performance. Now, the thing I love about this, the eight sleep is that, I mean, the entire thing is so well done. The user interface, uh, the actual equipment is absolutely incredible. It has been a game changer. Uh, for me and my family. Head on over to 8sleep.com slash the move. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is an episode of The Forward, but just work work with me here. It's 8sleep.com slash the move, all one word, and save $150 on the pod cover. Stay cool this summer with 8sleep, now shipping within the U.S., Canada, the U.K., select countries in the EU, and down under in Australia. 8sleep.com slash the move. Also today's show brought to you by HVMN. We often hear that fasting and exercise are good for the brain. HVMN launched the world's first drinkable ketone in 2017. Ketone IQ is their latest innovation on ketones with improved effectiveness, taste, and cost. Ketone IQ delivers clean fuel that can cross the blood brain barriers, supplying your brain and body sustained energy, focus, and sharpness. It is no wonder that HVMN supplies ketones to more than 60% of the teams in this year's Tour de France. 
and has an active $6 million contract with the U.S. Special Operations Command. You can save 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash the move. See, I did it again. I know this is a forward, but just work with me here. Again, that's hvmn.com slash the move. Well, you mentioned Kipchoge. How about this? When I did Berlin last year, I got a, a bib starting with the pros. So I walk into the... Uh, <laughs> Was that a mistake? Or no, that? no, no. You know, it's kind of like quasi like, hey, we, we're happy to have you here. Start with the like pros slash VIPs, but it was just pros and me. Right. So I walk into the pro tent and uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny looking back on it because, I mean, I look like the Incredible Hulk compared to those right. guys, right? I mean, I only weigh 160 pounds on my, at my heaviest. I'm right. usually around 155 and I walked in there and, um, but these guys are skinny and all the countries are sitting together, like the Chinese are sitting over here, the American guys, and some of them recognize me, which is still mind blowing to me because they're like, hey, Ken, come sit with us. And I'm like, oh, there's no seats over here. So the only seat left was next to Kipchoge and the oh, Kenyans, no. but everyone's clearly like avoiding him. So I just went over there. I was like, hey, what's up, fellas? Kipchoge, bang, knuckle bum, sit down, putting our shoes on together, chit chatting. It was crazy. And then we walked out to the start line together and there's a picture of us on the start line in Berlin where he's there and I'm like right behind him, like one or two people behind him about to start the Merle Berlin Marathon. He speak English? Yeah. He does. He speaks yeah. English. Yeah. Yeah. Super nice guy. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, that I would, I, I don't even know what I would do. Yeah. I, well, I, I fucked I, myself because when he took off, I st tried to hang with like yeah, the second group of I mean. pro women and I was running like, I was in good shape though. It's, and it gives you like false sense of security. So I was like, I'm taking out, it was humid. In hindsight, it was too humid to go this hard, but I was running like 530s through 15 miles with these pro women and every step I was like, man, I know I'm going too hard, but man, maybe today is the day, mm. but it's literally like so predictable marathon. It's so much about experience. If you go too hard in the first half, you will not finish strong. Right, right. You have to run close to even to negative splits to right. run a PR. Right. Uh, you know, I've only run, I don't know, four or five marathons and I always, but people ask me a lot that want to do a marathon. Like, Oh, will you coach me? Will you train me? I was like, no, I don't know. In <laughs> fact, we just had a, a kid who works for us, uh, ran the San Francisco Marathon. He asked the same question. I said, no. But I kicked him over to Riccatello. I said, hey, Jimmy, just Jimmy's you know, man, yeah. train this kid. Like, because I don't. Yeah. But the one thing I always tell people is, uh, because to me, for a marathon, yes, you have to train. But to your point, like, it's strategy, right? And, Big and, time. And, and also just knowing, and I've heard you talk about, and I talk, it's funny enough, I talk about this, like, looking at your dashboard, like, which... Which which uh, lights are, are yeah. now yellow, yep. soon to be red. And so you're just looking at this dashboard. But what I tell everybody, and I told this kid who works for us, I said, listen, mile 20 is halfway. 100%. Right. Anyone who doesn't it, believe that hasn't done enough marathons. And they can't get their mind around that. Wait. Yeah. No, that, they think uh, you're crazy. They think you're crazy. So you get it. I'll tell you what I would do if I started the Berlin Marathon, which isn't going to happen, uh, standing behind Kipchoge, I would run like 100 yards. I'd be like, oh shit, my shoe just came untied. <laughs> like I would just get out of the way. Like I don't want none of that. Normally I would do that, but I was like, fuck that, I belong here. <laughs> Who are these guys? The crazy thing is as I'm standing there, people are trying to come up, trying to squeeze by. And you know, at that point you're like, I'm pretty nice to everyone. But at that point you're in like fucking fight mode. Like if you're in the tour and someone's like, hey, I'm coming in here. You're like, no, you're not. What the fuck are you doing? So people were trying to come by. I'm like, yo, yo do you see me standing here? Get the fuck out of here. Like, this is not like nice guy time. Well, we can be friends at the finish line right now. I'm like strategically tucked in here exactly where I want to be. Right. But if he's running at 430, then you're a minute behind after a mile. Yeah. So after they took off, I was like, all right, once, once we get enough people we'll get around me, we'll get into the pace that I want to run and I'll just slip in and just stay on someone, yeah. which is what I did in successfully. Thank God in Tokyo this past March, I ran 229 low and I just stayed with the same group of people probably for like 20 miles. Yeah. Yeah. But that was the first time I ever ran a negative split in a marathon. Right. And I want to say I was like 250th at the halfway and I finished like 114th. So wow. on the, on the back end, not one single person ran past me normally in the marathon, someone's coming on strong at the end, but not on this one. I was the one finishing strong. Right. No one passed me. I was just blowing past people. It was yeah. like 
a magical feeling. That's but to that's point, it, well, in terms of feeling, that feels a lot better than oh. it would be in the Jake leg that everybody's <laughs> blowing by. In then Berlin. you really are stopping to tie your shoe and be like, I got a shoe issue. In this. Berlin, I, I literally, I thought I was going to die. I yeah. ran 235, the worst I've run in years. And I, and it took everything I had to just get to the finish line. Right. I was like seeing stars, dizzy. And in Tokyo, I ran, I finished, I, I have the KOM for the last kilometer of the Tokyo marathon, ran it faster than anyone in the race. Wow. It, or at least anyone on Strava. Right. Well, that's most people these days. Yeah. What is, do they, I mean, they must keep like, you know, world records for individual age. Or oh, into, it's, I'm not even close. Oh, you're not. I, some guy somebody, ran, uh, somebody, they knew you were coming on and they said, well, I, was, I don't know, if I can run 229. I said, well, that's going to be a close. world record. I said, nah. I don't know. I mean, there's got to be, Mm-mm. I mean, it's probably. I'm not even close. Some guy ran 225 in, in London last year at the age group world championships, right. a Belgian guy. There's a handful of guys that are like so low to twenty. Yeah, I, but I would I would guess that there's Kenyans in their fifties that have run under two twenty as a fifty two year old. Yeah, oh, uh, over fifty. Wow, definitely. <laughs> I mean, two years two years ago, I won the Masters division at New York City the, when I was fifty. I think I was the first person over fifty to win the Masters at any major. But the previous two winners for the that was over forty. The previous two winners were like Meb and Abdi Abdi Rockman. They ran like fucking two twelve, but I ran two thirty three on that day. But I was like, hey, no one else is here. All I can do is beat the people here. Like I I had no idea that I could even contest that division. And when I was finishing, coming up the finishing shoot, Shalane Flanagan was closing on me. I looked back and she sprinted, and because the crowd's going crazy, I'm like, I know they're not going crazy for me. And I looked back and she's closed. And I was like, fuck this. I started, <laughs> I started sprinting like a lunatic. I beat her by one second and I won the master's division by three seconds. But you know, the, the, uh, the, thing, is so, you. the thing is so staggered that I, I definitely wouldn't have sprinted like that had she not been closing on me. And I probably could have lost it by like two or three seconds. Right. So it was a nice surprise. I didn't think that I would even, I had never even thought to, that would yeah. be a possibility. You know, the thing I do remember the most about just our chats over runs and rides and hanging out is, is, uh, you know, just this, and I don't know how much you've talked about or has been talked about, but it's stuck with me just like this and you, <laughs> for anybody listening or watching and listening, I mean, the accent is thick, right? So you're obviously not from Texas, not from California, <laughs> not from Mexico, not from whatever, but you telling these stories of growing up in Boston and and, and working at the prison and, and I, man, I was just, I was like, damn, you when when you were telling me these stories of growing up, and I, I was like, that is like that's un, like unlike anything I've ever heard, like rough. I've listened to your childhood. I wouldn't say it's any different. It's just different different um, locations, different people around you, but different but same like socioeconomic settings. I was just around a lot of people because we were in the inner city and it was, um, yeah, man, it was rough. Look, I fucking became a drug addict as a way of coping with all the like trauma that I had Mm. seen in my life, which by the way, I would have never two years ago, three years ago, never thought I had any traumatic events. And then I went to um, onsite workshops. I know uh, know it very well. And uh, been a few times. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Because I have a friend who was there said they were there with someone who knew you. But so anyway, I went there at these, my friend's recommendation, a guy I bought my house from played for the Titans and he had gone there. And I was like, in a moment of like desperation, I was like, dude, fucking on site. What do you think? He's mm-hmm. like, best decision I ever made. I was, I was literally like, call you back. And yeah. I just went and paid for it and did it. Yeah. Did you go individual or with the group? Individual. Yeah. And then I got there, you know, you know, you get there, it's fucking, dude, I was like driving to the electric chair when I was driving out there. Mm. I was like, I, I was literally like driving there crying by myself. I'm like, what the fuck has become of my life that I'm so, I can't manage it on my own that I'm like going to, I kept referring to it as a psych ward. I'm like, what no. the, what happened to me? <laughs> they said that. <laughs> Jesus, right So out. when you, I you're get You're not supposed there. to say stuff like that, but yeah, I, I understand. Oh, I say that jokingly. I, <laughs> no. So I get there and- um I've talked to him about this, this, so I know he doesn't mind me sharing this, but I get there and they're like, uh, oh yeah, here's your room with two th- two other people. So there's three beds in there. I'm like, F- I don't even have my own room. They take your phone. I didn't know anything. They take everything. And a uh, guy walks in, big, athletic looking, handsome guy. And I'm like, oh man, you know, you're not supposed to ask any names or anything. So I was like, oh, did you play sports? Yeah, I played in college. Did you play after college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, Eric Decker. 
and uh we oh, became wow. like best yeah. boys he yeah. lives in nashville super nice yeah. guy but having him there was a fucking blessing because man that was i mean you know if you've been there you know it's yeah it's work man it, i feel like i was in a fucking eight-week training camp for yeah. like a heavyweight fight it was uh yeah it was deep yeah i mean i think for me and just to give some uh you know, some context and maybe some uh um just to fill it out a little more for the audience um you know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, will have a therapist, right? Um, and they'll see them, whether it's once a month or maybe once a week, and they sit on the couch and they talk, shed a tear every now and again. That's great, right? And I think that's, to me, um, and, and again, we're speaking about on-site, which I went for my first time four or five years ago. Um, you know, that's, uh, those are sort of band-aids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not, and I'm not criticizing that, but just based on my experience of talk therapy once a week or once a month or whenever, those are band-aids. Mm-hmm. Places like onsite, Hoffman, other modalities, that's surgery. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it changed my life and that's why I kept going back. In fact, I just did a tune up probably six months ago with, with the therapist that I met at onsite, who's now, um, out on his own, but. Yeah, man, it was, it was, I wasn't crying. I didn't think I was going to the death chair. I was nervous and excited. Um, I was, you know, I was alone. They put me alone. I don't know what that says about me, but, but when they (laughs) didn't know anyone that was alone, (laughs) I I was all alone. I didn't see, I saw people in the, in the dining area. Yeah. But outside of that, I stayed alone. I worked alone and this, and, 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 and even more, um, backstory. I mean, it's, you know, and you know this, I mean, it's for those listening, it, I mean, it was, they're 10 hour days Hell yeah. for four or five days straight. Yeah. Um, and they take your stuff, you know, they, they, it was fun, funny for me because we all, these you know, these fucking phones, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and they take everything mm-hmm. like the Apple watch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> give it up. Like, so computer, iPad, phone, anything, any, and I, yeah, look, people could sneak them in. Of course you could sneak anything in. Yeah. But um, you'd have to be crazy to pay that kind of bread and go there yeah, and sneak that yeah. kind of shit in. Cause yeah. it's so like, I give it up and you know, the, like the first day you're like, Hey, we're, Oh yeah. They took it. <laughs> Second day. I'm like, man, it's kind of nice. Yeah. Third day. I'm like, this is amazing. And then the fourth or fifth, whenever they give them back. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. Just <laughs> right. do you mind keeping them for maybe like a month? I just couldn't wait to call my wife because I put her through hell and back. So I yeah. couldn't wait to call her and explain a bunch well, I'm of glad, shit. I'm glad you did that. Yeah, that's why we do things like that because the people in our lives that we love and care that's about. Right. That's right. And, and, and for you, and I think, you know, the reason, you know, I went and you, well, you, you said it, right? I didn't realize, you know, in the way we sort of, without getting into a lot of my work or your work, but I can just talk about some of the, um, the, te- the techniques or tactics, you know, we, you know, we did a thing, you know, like a, like a trauma egg right? yeah. where you, you layer in literally anything that's happened in your life. If somebody, when you were 11 said, you know what, you're a little, you're a little punk ass bitch and yeah. you still remember it today, yes. whatever. I mean, that's if somebody right. flipped you off five years ago when you were writing, whatever it is, or even worse, something with a loved one, a parent, um, any kind of assault, sexual assault, um, anything you you put that in the egg and, and then you just, you see it all there and you're like, okay, because the world associates and, and as they should, they so associate trauma and PTSD with, with our veterans. Um, but which is true, but that, that doesn't mean that athletes don't have trauma. That doesn't mean that CEOs don't have trauma. That doesn't mean that wives don't have trauma. So yeah, that's rad, dude. I didn't, I didn't know that you, I mean, I knew you were living in in Nashville, but yeah, that was special. Yeah. To your point, like I was saying earlier, I didn't think I had trauma until I went there and started writing all the shit on the wall. And they're like, what about this? And how, what would this person represent of these animals? I was like, ah, fire breathing dragon, fire breathing dragon. (laughs) And uh, it was just, uh, it was eye opening. But yeah, to your point about the kids, like someone could say something to you that sticks with you. Like, I remember at one point, my mother married some guy from Alabama. It's a crazy story. I don't even know if I've ever told it before. We were in like the second grade and my mother moves to Alabama, like away from my dad, who my only real connection with him was through sports. But now I was like all alone and these kids were like fucking bullying me bad. I was just a little kid and they like knocked me down at the football game and the kid was standing over me. He's like, what are you going to do about this? And even now when I think about it, I'm so enraged that I'm like, 
with my own kids, I'm like, anytime someone has a problem with you, you will always be better served to try to fight. Because at least if you fight and lose, everyone else sees that you're not going to be pushed around and no one else, no one wants to fight. Mm -hmm. So if they know you'll fight back, they're going to leave you alone. And with my kids, I'm like, there's four of you. You should be able to handle this, anything that comes your way. So I've like tried to emphasize on my kids to like stick together. So as a result, they're like a pack of hyenas and <laughs> I've seen yep. them do it and they right. like really do stick together. But yeah, though, all those things add up and, um, going there and seeing it all in one place and seeing it all written down was eye opening and, um, yeah, yeah definitely yeah. changed my life and made yeah. me feel like, fuck. Yeah. I've got some things to fix. Well, I know I'm in, you know, I mean, if, if for, you know, this podcast isn't about me, but I will say real quick, like, um, uh, you know, it's, you could look at your, you know, you think about your upbringing, you think about your parents, all the things that happen to kids, right? Parents getting divorced. There's certainly worse scenarios like assault, any kind of assault. Um, and, you know, I certainly had a fucked up youth, right? The, that, that you're just like, wow, that, I mean, I spent most of my life just going, well, that sucked. Yeah. Right. I'm with <laughs> but you. the reality is, um, which all of that needed to be addressed anyways, but, um, you know, what's happened in my life the last now 10 years, I mean, you can't not, you can't have gone through the experience that I went through the last 10 years without having PTSD straight yeah. up. And so it just, you know, it took this little unraveling and then I was glad, man, it was, it was it's been the best thing I ever did. That's cool. Speaking of kids, this is uh for those, and you can find it on the internet, you know, you're hearing Ken talk, right? This guy just encourages kids to beat the shit out of other kids. Stick together. <laughs> Stick together. Defend yourself. Never, ever start a fight. So Don't be a bully. I was just having fun with that. But <laughs> you, 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 you listen to the guy, right? You know, he worked in a prison. I'm certainly not one to get in a fight. He's going to all the MMA fights with Dana White. He's at, you know, he's got a boxing podcast with Teddy Atlas, which we're going to talk about all this stuff. But just go look at you here in this guy, right? And you're like, Jesus, this guy's looks like he wants to jump through the mic and kick my ass. But go ahead, go on the internet. Here you have Kenny. You've got his beautiful wife. You've got these three beautiful white boys. Yeah. And then you get right there with this little Ethiopian girl. <laughs> It's my princess. So, yeah, ex thank you. I mean, that's, that's, it was in, you know, people ask me about Kenny. He's like, man, that dude's, that dude's intense. I said, I, I don't want to hear anymore. Just go look at the family photo, right? <laughs> like that to me, that, that's like hall pass for years. Like, I'm just like, wait, I mean, and we've talked a little bit about it, but give the audience, uh, like, how did we end up? I think it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I, when I met my wife, I said to her, I want to um, adopt children because, Again, reflecting on my own childhood, I, I feel so lucky. I mean, I have a degree from in sociology from Framingham State College. I went to New York and was able to have like a fairly successful finance career and make more money than I ever dreamed of. And I, I don't say that to be like, hey, look at me. I made a lot of money. Relative to rich people, I wouldn't say I'm rich. Right. But I've, I would have never thought that I would do right. the things that I did. So when I met my wife, I was like, I feel I, I'm not um, – I'm not very uh, spiritual, but I would say that I felt like if I don't do something to help someone else with the like gifts that I've been given, mm -hmm. it ain't going to work well mm -hmm. for me. And I said to, I want to make a difference in someone else's life. I mean, I, we would have adopted as many kids as we could afford, but the adoption process is, dude. If She's you, the oldest? Yeah. She if is. you don't want to how, adopt. How old is she now? She just turned 13. Great. Which we can talk about trying to raise a teenage daughter. I understand. <laughs> oh, oh, I'd rather get whacked in the head with a hammer than try to have like a, a sensible conversation yeah, with her about we life. Can get it. it's, it's, but, um, so yeah, when, when we started the adoption process, it actually was pretty smooth. As soon as we got married, we started it. We started trying to have our own kids too. And neither of us had any identifiable medical problems, but she wasn't getting pregnant. We did seven rounds of in vitro, three miscarriages. It was a nightmare. And I was like, all along though, I thought, It'll, it's going to work out. Well, it'll all sort itself out. So in the process of trying to have our own kids, the adoption gets approved. We go and get her. She's newborn, deathly sick. She weighed like, I don't know, seven pounds at four months, Whoa. like se severely malnourished. Born in Ethiopia? Yep. So oh, we wow. went and got her in the orphanage. My wife lived oh, you in- you went to Ethiopia? Oh yeah. My wife lived there for two months with custody of her because after you get, you go and, you go and adopt- then she's yours. And then the pro the uh, embassy has to process the paperwork, which is about eight weeks. So most people that have jobs that don't have this luxury, were like, okay, we'll come back in two months. But as soon as they hand her to you, they're like, 
it would be like giving birth to a daughter and they'd be like, all right, be back in two months to get. Right, I was right. like, we're not leaving. If, if staying is the option, we'll stay. So my wife stayed. I went back and forth a couple of times and, and I had to work, but she lived in Addis Ababa in a guest house, dude. It was, it was rough, man. We checked into that room. There was no mattress, just a box spring. And I'm like, guys, the mattress is missing. They're like, no, no, that's that's the bed. That's I'm like, it. It, there's no bed. It's like a hardwood floor. <laughs> My wife was like, it's fine. I go, you're going to be here for eight weeks. She's like, I'll get an egg crate or something. I'm like, where? Costco? It's like, you know, you're in right. Addis Ababa. So she lived there. And then literally, I the while we were there getting custody of her, she must have gotten pregnant that week. So when she came home, she was two months pregnant. And but she my, got pregnant on that box ring? It was okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I just want to make Good sure enough. I heard that right. She got a pregnant and <laughs> Maybe a, you and a tried herniated the, disc. You should have tried the Ethiopian box spring before yeah. you did seven rounds of IVF. Uh, I was fucking anything to like keep the flow going. Anything to like keep trying. I was the best at trying. But uh, so when she came home, she my son was due on my daughter's first birthday. So we only had her home for, you know, eight months, six months before. Cause she came home at four months and then, yeah. And then he was a month early. So right. all the kids' birthdays are within five weeks. She was like, had that one fertile window annually and got pregnant every two years. And so now we have three boys, 12, 10 and eight. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, middle school girls. <sighs> it doesn't make any sense. It's completely irrational. Well, it must make some sense because it's totally consistent. And I say to her, I want you to fucking treat me as nicely as you treat your friends. I everything that you want. Hope, you, I hope you don't say it like that. More or less. <laughs> I go, everything you have, you want Lululemon shorts for no reason. Okay. You want Air Jones. Okay. And then you come home and you give me the bad attitude. I don't understand. You're like, you couldn't be nicer to your friends. They're the coolest people in the world. I'm a jerk somehow. Cause I would say, come and say hello to me when you come home from school. It's just, it, yeah. it makes no sense. Yeah. But well, that's been, have, it's I been have, a struggle, man. Honestly, I have two that have gone through that period, and now Olivia, our Olivia, is, is twelve. So it's the same <sighs> thing. It's it's yeah yeah. I, I, it, it <laughs> you know, she's like, Dad, I want to go to the Drake concert. So you get on like whatever Seat Geek or whatever. I'm like, whoa. Okay. My daughter Taylor says, Swift. No, she, she went to Taylor Swift at, at Bronco Stadium last summer, and I. Uh, uh, <laughs> I hear you. All the fathers listening with middle school girls are just like, they're just like, see, <laughs> but they come out of it. Like totally. I don't spoil, I don't spoil them by any means. Usually if they want something out of the ordinary, like if she wants Lululemon shorts, usually I'm like, all right, I'll pay for half of them. But you just have to have some, you have to have some like skin in the game. You can't just get whatever you want, but shit like that. She's like, Oh, Taylor Swift is in Nashville tonight. I'm like, we're going, I go, let's do this. <laughs> Pull up the internet. I'm like, $2,000 for nosebleeds. I'm like, I'm sorry, girl. Like, <laughs> unless we know someone who can help us, I can't do it. Right. $4,000 to sit up in the friggin' shit seats in a, in a football stadium, watch a concert. <laughs> I go watch the YouTube special. But yeah. that was like, and, I, and that one, I was like, I'm just not doing it. I'm sorry. I'd rather give you $1,000 than spend four to go to this concert and be unhappy. I see she, she don't want that. Um, does she, uh, I'm just curious. I mean, I know some, of course, adoptions, kind of vary but some sometimes there's contact for the with the yeah we're the in family. contact with her mom we met her yeah, when okay. we were there and my wife stays in contact yeah. with her and they use uh, google translate and talk back and forth you just wow. a young girl really nice super religious um interestingly my wife when we were trying to we met her while we were there but literally the agency sells you like a line of bullshit they're like oh she doesn't speak amharic she's speaking some other dialect and we have ethiopian professional runner friends that i was like look at this video what's she speaking they're like she's speaking amharic i'm like then why the fuck is the interpreter acting like we needed to inter it, they just don't want you in contact with them with the with right. the birth parents to avoid the look of like fraud, like you're paying the mom or Got something, it. right? So we Shelby put on an Ethiopian adopt adoption group on Facebook, like, hey, my daughter's name is this, the mom's name is this. And a woman like a day or two later calls sends her a message and says, my children are your birth mom's brother and sister. I adopted them from your birth mom's mom. They live with us in New Hampshire. So ten, they're only like a year or two older than Tensei. So she has an aunt and uncle in New Hampshire. We, we, we speak to them. We haven't met them in person, but like they'll call the house on like holidays when they're in DC with the extended Ethiopian family. Of course, Tensei wants nothing to do with it. She doesn't want to be adopted. She doesn't even want to acknowledge that she's adopted. Right. Nothing. She right. doesn't want to that talk. That was my about next question. Yeah. Like, is that even of interest? 
I think when she's older, she'll, right. she'll, we'll go back and meet her. But like now when Shelby's in constant contact with the mom, so we haven't like lost track of her. So right. at some point we definitely will, we're planning on it, but right. probably when but she's, she's out a school. regular American oh, yeah. middle school, hundred percent high maintenance with her freaking cranky. braces and her Lululemon <laughs> stuff. And uh, yeah, dude, she's just like a typical American girl sports. <laughs> she does, <laughs> but she, unfortunately know. for Tensei, she didn't get too many athletic genes. She yeah. um, well. she loves music and like creative stuff, and uh, she's playing lacrosse because her friends play. But uh, yeah, and, she, your, and your boys. You said the youngest was like a he's the a youngest little, he's is a, a nut. Little, he's a killer. He's a killer. I mean, every time he gets the ball in football, boom to the house. <laughs> they have to take him out of the games. And but he but I will say this. Of all my kids, he's the kindest, nicest kid. Yeah. He's super friendly. He even said to me, he's like, Dad, did you see when that kid pushed me when I handed him his flag back? I said, what did you say? I said, oh, I didn't say anything. Dad, we were killing them. What was I going to do on right. top of it? Beat him up? Yeah. I was like, good boy. Yeah. Because so he, he could. He got dad's sporting genes and mom's. Mom's sporting genes. And, 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 and sort of personality. No, hopefully. mom's the athlete for sure. She's 10 times more athletic than I am on a relative yeah, basis. I'm a shit athlete. I'm just trying hard. Okay. Right. I wasn't really good at anything. I mean, I played football and hockey in college division three, but I was like, just there fucking yeah. in division three. Like if you can run from one end of the field to the other without falling down, you're like you're on the team. Yeah. yeah. All right. Get in there, Ken. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> what hockey, was it? I was okay. The university or what? What did you say? Framingham state college. Framingham, never even heard of that. It's the Harvard of Framingham mass. That's what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about boxing for a second. Cause I know you're, uh, uh, you know, crazy about it and MMA, but you, you, you have the podcast with, with Teddy. Uh, you, you guys still do that, right? Yeah. The every fight. day, every Monday, every Monday, every Monday. Why wouldn't you just do it after like a big fight? Like, we do, do it on Monday. What if there's no fights? There's always some fights. Oh, there is. There's always. And if you there's- You got to watch like, them. I love it. I love yeah. it. When my wife's like, oh, we got a party on Saturday. I'm like, not for me. I'm working. I got to watch these damn fights. Oh, you're such. <laughs> she's like DVR. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I go. I don't want them to blow it. Someone's gonna put on Twitter what happened. I can't miss it. No, we 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 manage it. But yeah, but there's always something. And then if there's not, we'll do like fight plans, like a preview of upcoming fights where we get in the ring and walk through what to look for from each guy. Like, okay, if this guy, this is what this guy can do to win. Watch him like faint with the jab, and then he should step in behind it to X Y Z. And then in the course of doing that, at one point. Teddy and I trained Alex Vosdick. I was like his assistant trainer. Alex Vosdick was Olympic bronze medalist. He had the WBC light heavyweight title. And we fought Artur Berbiev, who was the IBF undefeated Russian champion. And we had a um, huge pay-per-view fight, ESPN pay-per-view in Philly. We lived in Philly for eight weeks in a training camp. It was crazy. It didn't go home once. It was like wow. we were getting ready for the Super Bowl. I mean, this was a unification right. fight. Two undefeated champions. It was a wild experience. I mean, crazy. You get, in the ring, you get in the ring, let them put on the, no, the pads. Dude, no way. This really? is these t- the fucking light heavyweight champion of the world, dude. He was beating up the sparring partners. No, like just they with were the like, pads. Let him hit your oh, hands. Oh, no, 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 Teddy. The, 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 imagine being in, preparing for a Super Bowl and uh, Parcells of Belichick's the coach. There was no fucking about. This was like deadly serious business. Teddy wasn't. At one point, we had sparring partners, so I would work the corner for the sparring partner. And Teddy was just, I mean, he's all business there. It's like, we're friends, but he was like, he was like Bill Parcells type, right. just nuts. Right. And he was like, uh, Ken, work the corner for this guy, Chem Kilich, a, a Turkish undefeated um, super middleweight. And because, you know, the super middleweight is a little bit weight below, but they're always heavier prior to cutting weight. Right, so right. they were the same size. Right. So he's like... And Alex is just tuning him up and, and, and Chem's a pro fighter. So at one point he's coming back to the corner. I'm like, Chem, move your fucking head. Like, don't just stand right. And Teddy's like, Hey, Angelo Dundee, I told you don't coach him in between the rounds. He's doing exactly what I told him to do. But Teddy was like controlling the flow. He didn't want the kid to get beat up. If Alex was tuning him up, he'd be like, all right, stop that. Chem, I want you to do X, Y, Z, Alex. I just want you to work on slipping punches. Like, so he wasn't letting the kid get beat up like some some camps, like with Mayweather and some of those guys, they'll bring guys in and just beat the shit out of them, which right. is counterproductive to everyone. Yeah, right. You're yeah, going to get guys mind. hurt. Yeah, not going to. So like, well, we can't find anybody. <laughs> exactly. We were, we were walking around. Just some. <laughs> and today's episode also brought to you by True Classic. Now, this brand makes t shirts that actually fit, not to mention super soft. 
when you're jacked or trying to get jacked, like, you know, like I've been doing for the last few months, you know, work in progress. Sometimes finding the right t-shirt can be incredibly frustrating. Most t-shirts are too tight in all the wrong places or way too big and boxy, but not true classic. And if you're watching, you can see it. I'm actually wearing one. I actually love this t-shirt. I had a white one. I wore it so much. It's like gray now. Anyways, this thing has been a game changer for me. By the way, did I mention they're super soft? That's right. It's about time you get your fit together. Upgrade your wardrobe with True Classic. Get 25% off at trueclassic.com slash the move and use the code the move. Again, you got to work with me on this. That's trueclassic.com slash the move and the code is the move, all one word. Free shipping included on purchases of over 100 bucks. Again, trueclassic.com slash the move. What is your take? Because I, 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 I went to, you know, I got to know uh, Jake Paul and, and that whole crew through HVMN, which I know you work with. Um, and so we went to the fight. We went to this Jake Paul, Nate Diaz fight. And, oh, in Dallas? In, in Dallas. My son. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they invited me down and I thought, well, you know, that could be. I mean, by the way, it's at American Airlines Arena. Twenty thousand people sold out. I think sport. I think fights are the best sporting event in the world. By I've the way, been to. Fight. I've been to a lot of other fights. I mean, I've been to three Tyson Furies and a bunch of uh, uh, Crawfords. And um, anyway, so it's it's it was it's unlike anything. It's mm. not what I expected when I first went to a fight. I was like, this shit's gonna be crazy. Like it's mm. nonsense. It's not like it's it's more because it gets so quiet. During, I mean, it gets loud, obviously. Yeah. When, when any, anytime somebody lands something, the place erupts. But if they're just moving and, and, and positioning, it's dead silent, yeah. which is the cool part. And that my, you know, yeah. my wife has been to all of them with me, and she's like, this is not what I expected. Right? It was <laughs> it, all the pageantry and then just the, the, the way the whole thing unfolds. But so we go to the the Jake Paul fight, which, you know, my, brought my son, my older son. He loved it. Um, but what's your take on this uh you know, a fighter like Jake Paul that's, that, you know, didn't come from fighting. Yeah. I've got huge respect for anyone that would walk into the ring and fight another man for money. Right. They're fighting. I, and um, I mean, that's, I, I left with the same thing. I mean, yeah. I got, you know, I know they're, you, you, you hear, I really wasn't sure what you were going to say, right? You, you hear everything from, you know, some fighters going, this is bullshit. Don't, don't you know, get out of my sport. Listen, it's not high level <laughs> fighting, but to, to think that a dude in his fifth fight is fighting under fighting former UFC. Okay. The UFC, but they're still professional fighters right. to think that you could do that. And like one, by, by contrast, you look at someone like Canelo or Tank Davis that are superstars and it's not necessarily a knock on them, but the natural progression for a pro fighter is to fight 10 tomato cans. And literally, if you look at the record of Tank Davis, he might have fought five guys that had like two wins between them and 100 losses. I'm exaggerating a little, but if you look at their early records, any pro, you pick a pro, look at the first 10 opponents. I'll guarantee you that none of them had a winning record. With the exception of someone like Vasily Lomachenko in his second pro fight, now he's two-time Olympic gold medalist, second pro fight ever, he fights for a, a legitimate world title mm -hmm. and loses a decision, comes back and avenges it and beats him. But the pro and amateur games are so different. It, it's a big adjustment for amateurs, right? Because in amateurs, you're scoring on points. They're super fast. Their hands move so fast. They're just trying to touch you Get as many times. Gear. Not anymore. Oh, they, they remove that because it's like gives a false sense of security and lets you take much more extensive concussive blows. So now they like like with the UFC, if you get hit a shot, you're better off almost to go down than to just get a concussion type blow over and over and sustained yeah. over the course oh, of the wow. fight. So no more headgear in the amateurs. So like, like in the Olympics yep, next summer, no, there will not be headgear. Correct. Wow. I didn't know Most that. corrupt sport on earth, by the way. Olympic, Olympic boxing. boxing. Yeah. Oh my God. There was a, I think in 2012, Azerbaijan like bribed like several uh, officials, AIBA officials, like Association of International Boxing or something. Teddy was calling the fights and Teddy called it out. Like at one point, a Japanese fighter lost to a guy from Azerbaijan. The guy from uh, Azerbaijan got knocked down like three times and he still won oh, and wow. Teddy went crazy and they were like, yeah, you can't call the fights anymore. They made him call the last um, two days from a closet in the arena, but not ringside. Wow. 
And eventually they, the Olympic shit canned Aiba. They did away with that. I mean, it was so corrupt. It was like based in Azerbaijan or some former Soviet country. Crazy corrupt. But, but, but back to Jake Paul, man. So in the, and then, and maybe I saw it cause I watched his documentary. Um, I think it was on, what was, uh, uh, untold on, on Netflix, but it, they really had Tyson good. in there. Tyson said, listen, asses and seats. I'm a fan. hundred percent. And I roll up that night. I'm like, I don't, I mean, I know this place, you know, they play basketball to 16,000 people and there's a little ass ring in the middle <laughs> of it. It's gonna be, I was shocked. I was like, this is a show. I would say this, like the, the kids, like we had them on the show and I said, anyone who hates Jake Paul hates themselves. This is the American dream. You might not like the way <laughs> you might not like his personality, but this guy was like, Hey, I'm going to entertain you and you're going to pay me. And we do. And yeah. it's like, what, what, what's, you can dislike the character and stuff, but like, what, what has he done? He's challenging people to fights and, and no matter who he fights, you're like, he should fight someone better. You'll say he should fight someone better until he fights fucking Crawford and loses. Like, what's the difference? Two guys are going to get in a fight. How much to watch? I'll do that. I think one of my <laughs> the most fun fighting events ever is the uh, rough and rowdy on on uh, Barstool. Everyone they have, I buy it. It's like a pay-per-view online thing. Yeah. And they just take people basically from like the crowd in, in West Virginia and let them fight each other yeah. in a boxing ring. It's so entertaining. Well, <laughs> I love it. So anytime someone's like, hey, I'm going to Your fight. wife's like, we have a party tonight. No, no, Rough and Rowdy yeah. is on. <laughs> rough and Rowdy is always on a Friday, so I usually get away with that one. <laughs> What's well, amazing, I mean, he basically put the fight on. <clears throat> yeah, and which isn't easy. It isn't easy, but there's a whole crew for that. But you, like, you, you think, I'm putting the fight on. This is my production. This is my party. Guy, the kid walks out. 20,000, I mean, like 19,500 of them were just lighting him up, booing. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. I thought this was your party. I was shocked. And then Nate Diaz comes out. The place goes nuts. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like, how is this? <laughs> I was I was blown away. Yeah. No, I I love it. I, I think what he's doing is great. And it's, like I said, anytime someone's like, hey, I'll fight you for money. Like, oh, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm here for that. Yeah. I will say, you know, and I haven't trained with him, but by all accounts, man, he trains hard. Oh, he's got, he's does real like, professional boxer training. Yeah. yeah and, he's got a facility in, in Puerto Rico. He's yep. the real deal. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's gotten on the bike. He's training. Uh, yeah, they sent me a picture of him oh, on really? a bike the other day. Yeah, he's got the new Cervelo. He's got the helmet. He's got bike shoes clipped in, everything. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. Nothing pisses me off more than when you see like Conor McGregor well, riding a road on bike with like pedals. shorts and a tank top, no helmet, uh, with, sneakers. With, with, with platform pedals. <laughs> yeah. And the seat is like six inches too low. Too low. <laughs> he's just like elbows out. I'm That's like, That's like a pet peeve. Every time someone yeah. rides by me with I've the saddle too, too low, I'm like, yo, your seat's too low. <laughs> Most of the time they'll turn around like, really? Really? I'm like, yeah, man, it's way too low. It's, you feel funny? Yeah. <laughs> I can't help it. My wife would be like, why do you even bother saying anything? I'm like, I don't know. See, still, I was helping him. I wasn't trying to be a jerk. <laughs> right, right. No, that, I agree with that, man. Um, let's go back to running for a second because I, I have to talk about this, which, I mean, it, like when I woke up, I don't know, three or two years ago, whenever it was, the whole world started saying the world's fastest 50 year old. I was like, wait a second. This is the same guy who was always talking shit on me and wanted to go. <laughs> and then, then I, then, you know, you know, not that long ago, I opened up and he's halfway around the world. I don't even know how to describe it. I'll let you do it, but you're running some race in Mongolia. Yeah. You're wearing a backpack. <laughs> you're, and this is looks, it you know, obviously looks very different than any kind of marathon picture. You're running around in the desert alone. Mm hmm. And I'm like, oh, he's totally lost it. <laughs> Dude, it was fucking crazy. A friend of mine who works at Equinox, Gary Brown, he says, hey, I got the president of Equinox, former dean of Michigan Business School, um, Scott DeRue. He wants to meet you. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. Connect me. He's like, oh, by the way, I'm doing this race in Mongolia called the Gobi March. It's a self-supported six-day stage race. So every day predetermined like 20 to 50 miles for six days. And you have to carry everything except water in a tent that they provide. And um, I don't know why. Food you got to carry? Everything. Spare shoes? Everything. You Clothes, shoes, minimum safety equipment, sleeping bag, everything. Anything you want. Clean clothes. You don't need to take clean clothes. You had to have certain minimum things. You had to have a, a down jacket because it got cold at night. You had to have long pants, shorts, four pairs of socks, you know, and some basic, right. basic right. requirements. 
my backpack was way too heavy. I, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Mm-hmm. So the guy told me this and I said to my wife, just, I don't even know why. I still don't know why. I just looked at her and I said, am I crazy to think that I could go and do this and win this race? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you're crazy, but you always talk about doing things outside of your comfort zone. So fucking do it. You preach this stuff all the time. Dude, <laughs> take your own medicine. I got to meet your wife. By the way, and I've I never s- met your wife. <laughs> <And I> s- <laughs> to my wife. You know, my wife is like a TikTok sensation. She put up a TikTok the other day. She was on the Today Show. She got like 20 million views in a week. She does like little things with the kids, like lesson plans. My fucking son's frog jumped out of the cage and got stuck in the wall. So she was like staking it out for like six hours, waiting until it popped out because she couldn't get it. And then when she caught it and that's the one that was on the Today Show, it's crazy. So she was like, yeah, go for it. Okay. And then I was like, yeah, it's probably going to be like 25 grand. She's like, yeah, forget it. <laughs> we'll take the kids to Hawaii. So a bunch of, uh, I'm lucky that a bunch of brands that I work with were nice enough to step up like Equinox, Reebok, HVMN, Athletic Greens, Athletic Brewing, mm-hmm. who we both love. Mm-hmm. Um, they came through and helped me put this whole thing together. And they, But then, dude, this may put like professional athletes in perspective me because I was like, holy shit there are a lot of people like watching and thinking I can win this race. Like the pressure is oh, on. Were. Oh, I was like, I mean, in my mind they were, no one said like, we expect you to win. Right. But afterwards <laughs> when I did win the guy, uh, Chris, Chris um, at athletic brewing was like, Holy shit. I can't believe you won. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You can't believe I won. What are you talking? He's like, do you know how many people call us and tell us they're going to do X, Y, and Z? Can we help out? And blah, blah, blah. No one ever does it. I'm like, right. well, good. I'm glad you had a good experience. So I, 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 would, never, I would never do that. I would do a lot of things. I would never. It was awful. They were like, when are you doing the next one? I'm like, never. Right. Even for a hundred grand, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I think you said, I heard you say somewhere that, um, the 10, you know, if, if it were like five-star hotels and yeah. you, you, you'd consider, you but eat and sleep in a hotel yeah, and but just I'm suffer dude, during like, the day. Like, what are you eating? Like just in, in how many, MREs. What? Literally shit you buy at like camping food. You buy at, um. At REI, you know, you pour hot water in it, it, it it's dehydrated like Gross. rice and chicken. It actually wasn't that bad. <laughs> Did you bring some back? Honey. No, for dude, I was out of everything. I she was, leaves I was, and she's like, you feed the kids. And you're like, I got some of this shit. Left I still over. have a few left, but <laughs> yeah. I, I was like scavenging for food from other people because as it got later in the race, I had just the minimum. You had to have a minimum of 2,000 calories a day, which by the way, on I was measuring all my shit on whoop and I was burning... Um, 10 to 12,000 calories a day and consuming 22 to 2,500. So by the last day, I was like, I'm going to fucking, f- I'm so hungry. Right. And so I was like getting anything. People would throw half a food, half a thing away. I'm like, are you going to eat the rest of that? <laughs> Strangers. They were like, no, I'm like, give that to me. Dude, it was like, to me, we were in like survival. How many we people do war. that thing? Can't be that. Many. 125. Yeah. I would and think. probably 10 were competitive. Yeah. In the first day, I got- And that's the field's full. That's not like, yeah. hey, that's the, there's only 125 idiots in the world and they say, we're capping it. Nah, dude, there were so many like precautions. Like they had to have the, these buses follow us everywhere through the desert. So they had to have somewhat, we were never on a road or even near a road. These buses were driving through like the desert in the pastures because- one day, like a lightning storm came and they were like, everyone get in the bus. Like they had a contingency emergency escape plan every day if crazy weather rolled in. Right. So we'd get on, get on the bus to ride through the, um, till the, so the lightning passed and, um, on the lap. So, so going through the race on the first day, I get blown out. I finished in fourth. I'm like, holy shit. A friend of mine uh, who runs banking at Deutsche, um, James Davies, he said to me, man, if you could get top five or even top 10 at that race, it would be incredible. And I was like, are you fucking crazy? I'm winning this race. Like I'm telling you right now. I don't know if I believed it, but I was trying to convince myself. You couldn't even find Mongolia on a map and you want to win? Yeah. So then I sent a text to Rich Roll because I knew he knew about these races. I said, hey, Rich, go be March. What do you know? He's like, dude, claimed many a good ultra runners. I've never run an ultra in my life. Claim many an ultra <laughs> runner. Someone died there in 2010. Be careful if you're going to do that. I told him when I did his show in July, it hasn't come out yet. I said, when you told me that, I was like, fucking Rich thinks that this is too tough for me. Fucking fuck Rich. I'm going to kill this <laughs> race. <Yeah. laughs> but these are the things that I have to tell myself to do this because I didn't want to do it. When I was getting on the plane to go there, I was like, what have I done? 
what have I done? Everyone's watching. I just want to remind the listener, because this part of the show, when when you're getting a lot of candidates, you go, fuck this and fuck that and <laughs> fuck this and fuck you and fuck her. Just go back to the part of the show where the Ethiopian adopted daughter, like that's, that's the, we got to keep it. No, man, I'm living a life of service. Don't misinterpret the words. That's my defense mechanism. Uh, do you see like people out like, like, uh, like local, not locals, yeah, but like uh, uh, nomads? Moment. Hell yeah. It was They're awesome. just like cruising. Like they have no idea that y'all we are coming through. We ran past her every step of the way it was like just rolling pastures in desert so they'd be like you know like and uh, they don't know the race yurt. is coming it, no uh yeah the the i think that the like organizers a, go a through because they tie up the dogs dude they had mongolian shepherds that were like gigantic german shepherds and a couple times we went by and the guy was the swiss guy who i was really competing with we were yeah. together most of the time off the front and he had poles i didn't so anytime they came i would like literally i wouldn't even ask him i just snatch a pole i'm like dude this fucking dog's coming and then thank <laughs> god the dog would come and then he would spark and stop but i was like i mean it was it was like a wolf just, i want to be really clear if i would have seen a picture of you <laughs> with poles we're not doing this podcast <laughs> The crazy thing is, if I had the pulls, I wouldn't have got beaten so bad the first day. We were going up the side of a mountain. It was like it was like a black diamond ski slope. No, not on a trail, just up the side of the just mountain through y'all, the trees. Y'all go, y'all go up there. Bushes, bugs, uh, you know, cow shit. It was crazy. We crossed like six rivers every race, every day. So your shoes are soaked. You know, we're like waist deep in the water, <laughs> and the water isn't like some of it wasn't very clean. It was. It was no, cr- I'm sure it's not. It was yeah. crazy. I was just got into this mode of though of like. Right. This isn't, this is not forever. There are people out there doing much harder shit. I thought about like military special forces guys like Mitch Hall doing this stuff with someone trying to kill them. And that would literally put everything into perspective for me. I'm like, toughen the fuck up. Just get this over with. Let's go. Just empty the tank. We'll get to the camp and chill. So after the first day, I was like, I'm, I'm, I might be lucky to get in the top five. And then the second day was 28 miles. And I just went out purposely slow. And eventually we were just me, the Israeli, there was an Israeli special forces guy that was real good. And the Swiss guy were just running. And then I looked back and they were gone and I couldn't even see them. And I'm like, but I knew I wasn't off the course. And I just stayed steady and won that day, was down like 12 minutes. And then on the fourth day we did 50 miles and me and the Swiss guy were way off the front. And slowly he was like, dude, I got to walk. But at this point, it wasn't like we're going to kill each other because there was almost a responsibility. We're alone in the desert and there's like checkpoints like nine miles apart. Mm. You almost couldn't carry enough water to get to the next one. It's hot. And Ooh, now it's, it's the middle of the day. It are doing 50 miles and it's like three o'clock. So it's afternoon. hot during the day and cold Storching. at night. And cold yeah. at night. So That's he's cool. like, I got to walk a little. I'm like, all right, let's walk. And then he's like, dude, I got to sit down. I'm like, dude, please don't sit down in the desert. Like we have to keep, let's just get to the next checkpoint. You'll get water. So now at this point, he, I'm giving him my water. I'm dumping my water on his head. I'm trying to carry his backpack. And he's like, no, 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 no. Just let me rest for a second. I'm like, I can't leave him, but I, I wouldn't, but I, I, I can't leave him there, you know, and, and just take off. Right. He's sitting down. They might not ever see him again. And then eventually a support, <laughs> like a four by four Ford Raptor truck came by and I was like, Hey, and then they like started giving him aid. And I was like, are you good? You guys good here? And then I just took off. And that day I took like a 90 minute lead and that was it. That was it. Yeah. Hardest thing you've ever done? By miles. Right. I mean, because marathons are hard. I mean. This is not, it, that's not even on the same stratosphere. And so uh, you say that obviously it is the farthest you've ever run. Um, a marathon probably wasn't the farthest or maybe it was the farthest you've ever run before that. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> then it's. But marathons are hard, yeah. like, especially if you have a bad one. It's that, a different you, kind of hard, man, because in the yeah, marathon, like you said, if you do it right, you got a hard 10K. Yeah. The first 20 shouldn't be hard. It's uncomfortable, but like bearable. Yeah. Then you get into that, like, okay, all the all the lights are blinking and all the frigging dashboards exploding, but you know you've only got a mile or two. Right. This was more like managing that load for like hours and at a time. you can see forever. Yeah. And only the last day was like five. It took, you could see a mountain range barely in the distance. And you know, I have to get over that mountain range and then onto the next mountain range that you can't even see. But on um, the last day was like five miles and I had a 90 minute The lead. stage was five miles? Yeah. Just the ceremony. What is that? The last I mean, let's just lump into, it into the in, one before yeah, and this be done. Into the last, into the... Um, kind of ceremonial into the town, the Genghis Khan, like fortress, like a walled city. It was really cool, but it was behind a mo- over a mountain, small mountain. You just had to get up and over it five miles. And um, 
uh, a, a South African kid said to me like, man, you got it. You're going to take it easy. You're going to like let someone else win this stage. And I had visions of like thinking about the tour. I was like, I would never let someone win. Are you crazy? <laughs> We're fucking racing. Yeah. And sure enough, me and the Swiss guy got into a, like a foot race. I mean, we, I was sprinting. You got to carry the pack on the five mile. At that two? point, there's no food left. You just have like a backpack. I mean, a um, sleeping bag and your basic. Like but you could do five miles without all that shit. They make you keep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 You, okay. yeah. you have to finish with everything and you run into this walled city. And so I just took off and I was like, I have to represent the race i can't right. disrespect right, the leader's right, jersey right, and right. come in in second right <laughs> so even on the last day i was like almost killed myself because at that point it was crazy how your body adjusts and adapts you would think like how am i going to run a marathon every day if i told you we're going to run 100 miles this week you'd think oh shit that's a huge workload I would, I, would, I would say that but this was like you know 155 miles in six days it, but it was like anything like recovery you just like 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 addiction recovery you're just like let me just worry about today let me just get mm. through this day come back lay down and i'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow everyone's going to be dealing with the same shit that was what really kept me going i was like everyone has to recover the next day it's not like someone here is going to be some phenomenal like different human different species who can recover right. quickly we're all going to be hurting by the end oh. i'm just going to assume that i'll be hurting less yeah. or be willing to hurt more you get the hell out of there afterwards oh immediately did you oh i mean i, I, mean, I don't know maybe maybe the, the the you know the places around genghis khan's nah, you know chateau nah, nah, or whatever nah. the fuck is <laughs> nah. you just it's, split yeah we, we took the buses back to the uh ulan bata the capital and on uh, next morning 6 a.m boom out of there Ooh. <laughs> Hope you aren't flying in the back for that. <laughs> uh, I just told you I'm a big baby. I got to stay at the nicest hotels, yeah, flying first yeah, class. Yeah, that's right. I spent my that's whole why, childhood that's why in, in coach. I'm yeah, done with it. Your wife, well, I should have known that when you said it was 20 grand to go over there. I should have been like, <laughs> well, that's an expensive coach seat. <laughs> it was too, too long of a flight, for, especially from Nashville. I had to connect a couple times. <laughs> I, I, really? <laughs> You told me you're writing a book. Yeah. I mean, I'm, everybody listening to this podcast is like this. Why don't you just put some of this down on, on paper? Yeah. Yeah. About the life, about the, uh, it, well, well, it doesn't have to be, or it could just be a, you know. It's a, kind, of, kind of like a, like what I've approach. learned, like lessons learned and yeah. things that I've experienced and how I dealt with them because, listen, I can be very self-deprecating and get down on myself. When you go through that kind of addiction, it's hard not to like have a lot of self-loathing. It's mm -hmm. hard. I'm sure you've experienced this. Yeah. You, you, you can get along with your thoughts and convince yourself you're a complete and total piece of shit, not just, okay, I made a mistake. Let's fix this. You treat yourself 10 times worse than you would treat another person. Right. Right. You talk to yourself in a way you would never speak to another people person. At least I do. And, um, you know, I think that, some of the experiences I've had and some of the things that I've done to deal with the adversity that I've been through, some of it self-induced, um, is valuable information. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, if you apply some of these techniques to your own life, I think that you can overcome anything. Like when right. I came back from the Gobi race, I was like, I wasn't trying to be arrogant. I was like, what else can I do? <laughs> Could I win Leadville? Could I win Badwater? And I wasn't saying like, I'll smash those people. Like, but, but, if I'm going to win at anything, like I have to believe it first. And, and I think a lot of times people are afraid to state their intentions or state their beliefs because mm. you don't want to come across as arrogant or disrespectful. But the truth is, if you don't believe it, why should anyone else? Like you mm. have to believe in yourself. So just a lot of these things that I've figured out on my own or through therapy or however, I think that there is some lessons that I can um, impart or, or advice that I can impart on others to deal with some of the things. Yeah. Some of the things that I've dealt right. with might be relatable. Yeah. When I share this stuff and started sharing talks about the addiction, like you wouldn't believe they, people came out of the woodwork. Of course. Like, I'm going through this right now. Right. And I was like, listen, I'm not in a position to counsel others. I'm like barely surviving. But yeah. if if hearing my experience in my journey helps people to take the first step, because right. that's the most important is like right. being willing to go to onsite is a huge step. Right. Well, you thought you were going to the electric chair. When I was driving there, I was like going, I was going to check into prison for the week weekend. I wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to get there. We're going to the Bahamas this weekend. I was like, I didn't, you know, I'd, I'd go back right now. I'd leave right now. Yeah. But it's like the Gobi Desert. It's like you do these things that you know are going to be hard, but the only way to get better and to grow is to be uncomfortable and go through these, these moments of like, 
discomfort. Yeah. If you're just like fucking getting up every day and being like, yeah, things are good. I got money. Um, I'm going to go to take kids to practice, come home, have a drink. Like what the fuck? Like right. the clock's running. There's no injury timeouts. There's no TV timeout. The clock's going to run. One day is gone. If you don't do anything yeah. today, not that I'm saying you have to do shit every day, but there should be personal and professional goals. And for sure. me, the running is just, that's, I got four kids. The only thing that I have that's mine is my running. Right. I get up and do it before they wake <clears> up. <throat> but I think that it's a mistake when people don't prioritize yeah. their own physical and mental health. So my wife will sit like when we, we went skiing in Aspen last winter and she, every day before we skied, I run every day, for 10 calling. miles. Appreciate it. I knew you wouldn't answer. So when, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I, I was like, I heard Ken's in town. I haven't heard from her. <laughs> I ran, I run every day, but my wife knows she's like, just go get it over with so we can go enjoy the yeah. day and you don't have to have this hanging over your head. Right. And yeah, she's so in that regard, she's supportive of it. But I think people are doing themselves a disservice when they're like, oh, I don't have time. The kids have this, the kids have that. If you don't prioritize yourself and your own, the things that you have to do, like you're going to be useless to everyone. Right. And, and I, I'm just not a good dad or a husband if I don't do something to take care of myself. Yeah. I, not, follow, I follow this guy and, and actually invested in this company, Michael Chernow. He's got a really cool young oatmeal company called uh, Creatures of Habit. And, he, and I just caught this yesterday on his Instagram. And he was talking about the very, and he's uh, he's in recovery, uh, but it was it went very badly, um, uh, almost to death or was dead. It depends on how that goes. Came back. The guy is a beast. But he, I saw this clip and he was like, the most important person in the world is me. Yeah. Like, I love me more than, because if I don't love me, then I can't love my wife. I can't love my kids. I can't it's love my best truth. friend. I can't love my brother. And it was, I'll send it to you. It was as funny as this, it, I'm literally word for word. And the yeah. guy's a fucking monster. You have to do this, Like in man. the best way. When people are like, oh, you do that every day. Like, I'm like, you don't do that every day. You right. don't do something for yourself every day. Like your life yeah. isn't, you know, my kids aren't fucking Fabergé eggs. They're children. I'm raising them. I'm like, but they've got to experience some stuff on their own. They've got to deal with some things. Figure some stuff out. Yeah. I'm not going to be there to hold their hand when they get out of college and go start working. Yeah. You know what I mean? You see, I hear a story the other day. Some dude's dad was emailing a buddy of mine like, hey, my son's getting out of school. He wants an internship. I was like, what? <laughs> Can you imagine? This is, but this is like the the, the, the culture that we're, we're living in. It's yeah. like, can you imagine 20 years ago, someone being like, yeah, my dad's trying to get me an internship. He's sending emails out. I mean, it's one thing to be like, hey, Lance, I know you got a production company. My son's really into production and we know each other. Okay, but a cold email to a stranger, like talking up your son who's right. getting, what? <laughs> Fuck is wrong with you? Like <laughs> type an email to this guy and send it. Yeah. The uh, uh, <laughs> Here's what I wish, man, for you. I I, 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 I hope you write a best, <laughs> this is, I'm just, I'm gonna have fun with this. I hope you write a bestseller. And what happens when you write a bestseller? Then you go on the, the speaking circuit, right? All right. First company. I'm hiring the best selling author, Ken Rideout. He gets up to the podium. He's going to 30 minutes of remarks, maybe 15 minutes of QA. All right. Listen, motherfuckers. This is you. You're all pussies and fuck this. And fuck. I would never talk like One that. One and done. <laughs> no, I would never talk like that. It goes in the notes like the, the speaker's bureau is like, wow, you know, he came out with listen, motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm speaking to the um, uh, all of the Massachusetts pension plans. Um, in, at a conference in, um, in two weeks in Springfield. So like all the, um, you know, county and municipality, all the allocators, they, they, most of them deal with consultants, but all those allocators, um, come together for a conference mm -hmm. and I'm going to get to address them. And, uh, I still do some work for, um, different funds like private equity yeah. venture. And I've raised it, uh, I've raised money for a lot of funds yeah, over the last few the years. Past, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's uh, well, let me know how it goes. Yeah, for sure. I've done a bunch of I've, I've spoken to a bunch of elementary schools, too. Oh, I have a whole different. Yeah, I know you can. I, I mean, come on. Speech. I know you can control that. All right. Before I let you go. So I have to ask because you're you know, we're you're, we're here in Austin. I'm yeah. back. I'm here. You're here. I'm here. Uh, and you're with this guy, Jelly Roll. My man. That's my best friend. And so I because I, I watched. You know, I hadn't really heard of him. Like I, I listened to a lot of music and I, I listened to country music. And when I, I moved to Nashville, I had heard real the names, quick. but I saw the documentary like three months ago and I was like, now this is a story. Mm -hmm. Like if y'all haven't seen this jelly roll and I forget if it's on Showtime or Max Hulu. or on Hulu. I said, if y'all haven't seen, I mean, this story's crazy. Yeah. He's the best guy. So I met him at the, um, we live in a, in a, uh, on a golf course in Nashville. So when I went in there, 
uh, he saw me at, he's a big boxing fan and he saw me at the club and was like, Oh, I love the show with Teddy Atlas. So I'm talking to him and he's a big guy. So one he of the, guy. one of the waitresses came over and was like, you know, that that's jelly roll. I'm like, no, nah, do you know who that? Nah. I'm like, no, who's that? And when, so when I tell people, Oh, do you know who jelly roll is? They're like, no, I'm like, he's definitely the most famous person. You don't know if you don't yeah, know who I he agree. is. Yeah. But when I got there, I, I joke with them all the time. I'm like he couldn't get arrested. We, we, my friend, Jamie Horowitz was an exec at WWE and wrestling was in town and he loves wrestling. So I'm like, you want to go sit ringside on the WWE? Sure. We go there together. He had one security guy with him, but you know, a few people were like, Hey, jelly roll. 18 months later, he sells out Bridgestone Arena, right. 17,000 people. We can't go anywhere. I mean, went to dinner last night. He had two security guards with him. Like, it was crazy. And he's such a nice guy that yeah. people are just, like, all over him. And, but, a, and, a, and, a, and a crazy journey. Crazy journey. Like, you can't. I was watching this, like, come on. This, I mean, it's, dude, it's next he is, level uh, story. I was telling someone this this morning. His chef is uh, used to be a fighter, uh, used to be a um He's a fighter and he was a chef for a, a nutritionist for a lot of fighters. He goes to the fight camps and helps them cut weight. And he's traveling now with Jelly. And I was saying to him, like, you know, a lot of people, they see this Southern guy, he's kind of, he's overweight. It's easy to assume he's like not intelligent. But when you talk to him, mm -hmm. he comes out with some things sometimes. I'm like, what? He, he's incredibly intelligent and he notices everything and remembers mm. everything. And I identify with that because I do too. <laughs> Even with my kids, I'm like, who left this wrapper for the straw here? Like, if you do that and everyone does that, that means I've got to pick up eight straws every day. Like, why don't we just all take care of our own business? But we were sitting there at that restaurant and I was eating the pickled cucumbers. And he's like, you've had like eight uh, plates of those. I'm like, I can't believe you would wreck recognize that and notice that but that's what i would notice too and be like why does that guy keep eating all those cucumbers yeah. but i probably wouldn't say anything right well, but you that's... weren't getting enough food so you, had, you, were, you were eating whatever they put down i hadn't eaten all day and i did like a hard workout yesterday flew to austin and was late for the flight and didn't get to eat so by the time we got to scratch i was like i need six of everything but so i ate a ton of cucumbers but that's what i mean he he's he's incredibly intelligent super curious about yeah. a lot of things and then we went to um rogan's uh club the mothership it was awesome super fun time but i've known joe and they for a don't tell while. you who's performing or they do somebody told me that that i mean maybe they tell you guys but most people don't know who i, think, I mean it could what did you what did you say earlier a can of tomato soup i mean you could roll up and it's a can of tomato soup comedian and you're yeah. like oh picked a bad night or you could roll up and Dave Chappelle comes out. Yeah. You're like, I picked a good night. Yeah. He had uh Tony, Tony Hitchcliffe, Hitchcliffe was with them. was like one of his like normal, I think in the re regular rotation. And then there were a few guys that I hadn't heard of before. Yeah. I think Joe tries to give opportunities yeah. to a lot of yeah. uh, comics. Yeah, He's a good right. dude. And then, uh, and then we went down to the bar afterwards and they all came in. It was cool. But by like 12, 30, one o'clock, they're going hard. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a pussy. Goodbye, guys. <laughs> I'm going to bed. <laughs> I got too much stuff to did do. Did you run this morning? Yeah. You did in this yeah. heat? Yeah, every day. Every, you every do, like, single two, two day. Two or three miles? <laughs> I did uh, 12. Did you run down on the trail? I ran from Commodore did Perry you? down to the river. Yeah. Every time the river, yeah. Yeah, the rivers. I mean, I, I just just being back in Austin, and, and I mean, we've come back and forth, but- just being here, you know, basically every day and out riding or running, or whatever I'm doing, I'm like, damn. I mean, it is that that trail. I mean, Town Lake Trail, yeah, is such a vibrant scene. It's like, and it was all. It's always been that way, but super eclectic, dude. And what it's and so crew. many people. Like it's it's badass. I love when I see a guy come racing through on a, like a mountain bike or a road bike, we're all kitted out, and he's like racing. I'm like, dude. What the fuck are you doing? Like, you're going to kill somebody. Can you get on the road? But yeah. I ride on that thing. I hopefully slow. Well, I'm, I'm respectful. Respectful. Yeah. yeah you I mean, can there's ride nobody on. there that I ride. With, but I, I use it to get out to these side because these cars, I, mean, I don't like being, I, I tell it all the same all the time. I don't like riding with cars. I don't trust people no. in cars anymore. Dude, people looking so at their I, cell phone. All yeah. you have to do is drive down the road and watch what other people are doing. Yep. Everyone's doing it. Yeah. But, I've, done, um, I've done this thing lately where I get, I get, Either I get really mad because, you know, you're at a red light. I'm like, all right. And then it turns green and nobody goes anywhere. I'm like, so I'm, <laughs> I'm like laying on the horn. But then there are other times where I'm like three lanes over and I'm like, I have to be all the way in the right lane. Yeah. And I'm like, somebody's going to be on their phone. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> so in one hand, I'm like livid and laying on the horn. The other, the other hand, I'm like looking for opportunity. I'm like, there he is. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 
just, that's my hole. I'm in. Did I ever tell you the story when I was riding my bike in New York City? I went over the George Washington Bridge. The guy almost hit me in his car. Oh, you tell the story. And then I time. caught him at the light yeah, and he got don't, out, don't he tell got out to story. beat me up. <laughs> yeah. Then the police came and da, da, da. And I'll just remind the listener. This is also the guy, because I reminded them before in the last time about <laughs> the adopted daughter. I, I will now remind them of the guy who at one of the rest stops in this run around the Mongolian desert offered or did give his water to his main competitor. For sure. Just remind, I'm just, just bringing people back to the, to the onsite. The, camp. The, the accent <laughs> can throw people off. I live a life of service. I, I respond to everyone who sends me a message. I try to help anyone I can. Even if someone asks me something crazy, my wife says, just ignore them. I'm like, ah, I don't like ignoring people. I should right. at least tell them why I'm saying no. Yeah. And she's like, what? Yeah. But yeah. yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know. I think I'm pretty kind. I just don't want anyone to fuck with me. This is a good place to end. <laughs> Dude, it's been great. Let's not make it so Thanks long next time. Me. Yeah. No Thanks, problem. brother. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah.